All right, everybody, we're back. We're catching up with Coach. We have Prosecutor Jennifer Webb McCray here. Let the people know who Jennifer is. Hi, how are you? So if you're from Cumberland County, I am your Cumberland County prosecutor. Many people, you know, are not familiar with the, what the prosecutor's office does. Um, we have, we are the, um, I, as the county prosecutor, am the chief law enforcement officer uh, in the county. Um, and my office has really two real primary functions. One is that we prosecute all of the indictable crimes in the county. So if you um, do commit a crime and you're charged with um, a felony, which means that it's something you can face um, over six months in jail, it comes to our office. We have uh, 31 assistant, 31 prosecutors, including me. Um, and then we have 40 detectives. So we also have an investigative function. Um, and the, the detectives are all police officers and we investigate um, crimes. So we have a major crimes unit and we have a sexual victims unit. Um, and we also take those cases that we get from the police departments mm -hmm. and we have investigators uh, shore those cases up if we're gonna prosecute them in um, superior court. In addition to that, being the chief law enforcement officer for the county, I also am charged with making sure that all of the attorney general directives and uh, all of their uh, guidelines are uh, implemented in Cumberland County to meet the needs of Cumberland County citizens. So that's an oversight function of the police departments. Sometimes my mom, when she tells people that I'm the county prosecutor says, oh, she's the boss of the police. And that's not really true. My role is to oversee their functions and make sure that the things that the attorney general cares about, that they, um, that they carry them out in their jurisdictions, like internal affairs, um, like body worn cameras, like um, things like, it used to be officer involved shootings, all of them, but now the, the state does anything where someone dies, but if someone did not die, but they were subjected to serious bodily injury, um, we have to oversee them as well. So there's a lot of um, oversight functions that um, are part of my duties as well. So that's kind of what the prosecutor does. Awesome stuff. So what yeah. about um, education, personal life stuff? You know, um, tell us about that background. Yeah, so I always, when I talk to kids, I always ask them, do you know what, uh, like what I had to train to be to become prosecutor? And some of them, as they get older, understand that the prosecutor is a lawyer. Um, mm -hmm. By, by um, you know, nature of our, our county prosecutor statute, the prosecutor is an attorney. I am a law enforcement officer from, from the um, perspective that I've, I've, uh, sworn an oath to uphold all of the laws in our constitution within our um, county, but I am not a police officer. My job is more um, oversight. And I always say to people that um, oftentimes you have to um, Monday morning quarterback decisions that are made in split seconds. So I take that oath very seriously. But I am, you know, I am not a police officer. I just have oversight responsibilities, but I've been a lawyer for 25 years. So um, wow. I went, you know, straight through school. I had to go to school for seven years to become a lawyer. I was a lawyer by the time I was 25 years old. So I still am dating myself. But um, awesome. before becoming prosec prosecutor, I was a public defender. Um, and then I went into pri private practice and did that for a uh, little under 10 years. And now I've been prosecutor for um, almost a, going into my, going towards 11 years. Wow. Yes. Awesome. That's good stuff. So, so. Do you uh, do, I know your job has a lot of pressure and you meet a lot of people, you know, through it, both positive, both negative, you know, how do you manage to keep your integrity while dealing with like disrespectful situations? I know that's, that could be rough. Um, well, a prosecutor's job is to do justice, right? And, you know, oftentimes when I interview young lawyers to become assistant prosecutors, they often think of that as representing the police. Um, but really it's not, it's to represent the people, right? 
and justice you know, has an element of punishment to it, but it also has an ele element of compassion, right? Yeah. And um, with that, with I've taken that very seriously. Um, and sometimes like, yeah, there's stuff that's disrespectful, but it's not really disrespectful to me. It's disrespectful to the system, right? Mm -hmm. And why, why would sometimes people who, you know, why would people be disrespectful to the system? There's a lot of reasons. Um, and a lot of those same reasons that we see in um, things like, you know, social justice, they come up in criminal justice, right? Yeah. So I try to have compassion for people and understand that it's really not, most of the time, it's not disrespectful to me. It's not personal. It's how they're feeling about how the system treated them. And sometimes, you know, it's unfounded. They shouldn't feel that way. And other times it can be founded. And that's, um, you know, being a public servant and a public official, it's important to have that compassion and then be able to be open-minded to figure out why people feel the way they do. So um, I never really set out to be prosecutor. I always wanted to be a superior court judge, but when this opportunity presented itself to me, um, I realized that it was a way to shape what justice looks like in our community. And I always say, yes, justice is a noun, right? Because it's a thing. But I also think doing justice, it's kind of like a verb as well, because we, we as, um, me as a public official, police officers doing their jobs, they have a real solemn responsibility to do it in a way that it always is with integrity. That's so right. um, what I try to do for myself, like when I'm presented with really hard decisions, um, is make sure that I'm making those decisions in good faith, that it's for the right reasons. And sometimes they're very hard decisions and I, I don't know if it's right or not. But, right. but as long as, cause I can't see the future, right? But as long as I know that I'm making those decisions in good faith, I can go to sleep at night and I can look myself in the mirror and say, you know what? I'm comfortable with that. Cause I wasn't, I'm always challenging myself to make the decisions for the right reasons. Exactly. Awesome stuff. So what you're saying, you wanted to aspire to be a judge, you know, um, where did that come from? That, um, inspiration? Well, I, um, when I was in, right after I graduated law school, mm -hmm. I clerked for Judge Stanger. He, he's now retired, George H. Stanger. And he was a juvenile judge at the time, but he later became our assignment judge. But he became a mentor of mine for all of my career. And he really steered me in directions to where it put me in a position to be considered for prosecutor. And um, he had said to me, you know, we, this is 20, this is 25 years ago. Uh -huh. He's like, we've never had an African American Superior Court judge in Cumberland County, and you could be the first, but you wow. have to do certain things to position yourself to be considered for that position. And interestingly enough, we're in we're 25 years later, and we have never had we've had, you know, we have, I'm so proud of my friend Demetra Katad Ruiz. She's African American and she's the first. African American municipal court judge mm -hmm. in Milan. But, you know, in terms of superior court judges, we still have not had um, an African American superior court judge in Cumberland County. Wow. So, you know, that's still something to attain to. And you, and you say to yourself, and I know people will say, well, why is it important? Why is it important that you're the first African American prosecutor or you're the first female prosecutor? So, why is it important to have a African-American judge. Well, the only importance that I really think it, an important importance, not the only importance that I think it brings to the system is that people have to come from different perspectives and, and different life experiences to make things objective, to make everybody feel like they have a place in the process, right? So even in my office, I strive to make my office representative of our community. You know, do we have females and males? Do we have, um, you know, Spanish speaking people that can serve our Spanish speaking community? Do yeah. we have African Americans? Do we have, it's important to have people that come from different diverse perspectives 
able to dialogue with each other, able to challenge each other, and able to re you know be representative of the community. So he put that thought in my head, and he put me in a lot of circles and gave me a lot of assignments, like they were volunteer assignments, yeah. um, that then put me in a position where you know that at that point it would have been 15 years later I could be considered for a judgeship or for a prosecutor's position. And, um, you know, like I said, I never set out to have this position, but to be one of 21 county prosecutors. And, um, you know, there's a perception that we have a lot of power. And mm -hmm. we do, because decisions that I make affect people's lives, right? Yeah. Um, it's a solemn responsibility, but I also feel very privileged to be in that position and be able to shape and and have some control over how I impact people's lives. Wow, that's awesome stuff. I appreciate that, sis, and all that you do. Thank you, thank you. So with you having so much on your plate, you know, um, being married, being a grandmother, and your job duties, how do you cope with being overwhelmed at times? You know, I know we all deal with that. What has worked for you? Um, well, I, I try to be organized, um, yeah. you know, it's, I don't know anything different, I guess. Like, yeah. I think that, you know, I oftentimes, like when I was in private practice, I had two male partners, right? Mm -hmm. And I would go home and I would wash clothes or I would um, cook dinner, right? And I would often say like, are my male counterparts, do they have to go home and cook dinner and wash clothes and take care of kids? But this is just my, you know, experience. I'm very proud to be a mom. Mm -hmm. I'm so, you know, it, it's it's even more fun to be a grandma. I have stepchildren, so I have small uh, small grandchildren, mm -hmm. and um, it's I've known no different than what I've done. I'm lucky to have a really supportive husband, mm -hmm. um, and really, I think it's a testament to my to my son that um, he and my parents and my husband, that they allowed me to be a career woman and really supported, you know, the long hours and the kind of work that I have to do and sometimes being called away unexpectedly and things like that. Um, my husband isn't, he's retired now, but he's a retired uh, major from the Department of Corrections. So he often worked shift work mm -hmm. um, and my parents, would help me by taking my son to like sports events and um, I was really lucky I didn't have to have a babysitter most of the time and they made it possible and poured a lot of uh, support and love into my dreams so that I could do what um, I do and they still do even though my son's 22 they still support me in a lot of ways so that I can you know be a career woman so I'm I'm very appreciative of that. And um, I try to look for ways to challenge myself. And I never thought like with this pandemic that I could um, work from home. I, I always thought like, I'm not that person who can work from home. I'm very easily distracted. I wow. need um, quiet to concentrate. And I, you know, I used to say, oh, well, I could never work from home. I'd be getting up like watching the soap operas or Jerry Springer or something like that. Uh -huh. But over the last few months, um, with the dealing with the pandemic, uh, we have to we've had to split our shifts up so so the whole office doesn't get contaminated because you know our our major crimes are our, our SVU unit they have to be able to get out there when they need to to respond to murders and serious crimes right uh -huh. so I'm I'm one week in the office and the other week home. I feel like I'm working harder from home than I was from the office because the day goes slower because I'm concentrating, right? I'm not being distracted and pulled in a lot of directions. So I've like I've challenged myself and actually am pleasantly surprised that I can focus so much on work and be productive. So I just try to in my life um, not look at obstacles. Mm -hmm and look at things as challenges and right. then try to like, um, sometimes like when we have a big challenge, it looks like, oh my gosh, I'll never get that done. I'll never be able to achieve that. 
And I find that if you break things down into baby steps and you just say, okay, I'm going to complete this first part and then I'm going to get to the next part and then I'm going to get to the next part, that it makes it a lot easier. Yes. And then another tool that I use is that I, I love working collaboratively with other people and I have a really good team at my office. I have, um, my chief is wonderful. My first assistant is wonderful. Um, I have a lot of good people that I can bounce ideas off of mm -hmm. and, and we figure out solutions together. And that's made it, um, I've done that throughout my whole career. And I, and I really think that I, it's good for me. It might not be good for everybody, but to, to have colla a collaborative process where you can, before you make a big decision in your life or a big decision for a client or a big decision for an organization that you're leading, that yeah. you have people that you can bounce it off of it, that you can talk to. And, and realizing that um, maybe you, you're not the smartest person in the room, that somebody okay. else might have a good idea and be willing to listen and willing to let them challenge you. That's right. So um, those are kind of the things that I use in my, in my professional, but also in my personal life to try to always be pushing the ball forward a little bit. Wow. That's awesome. That's great stuff. I definitely got to use some of those measures. <laughs> yes, yes. I think, you know what, it's funny because a lot of people ask me that, like, what's it like being a woman who's leading an organization? Mm -hmm. I think women, we tend to be more collaborative um, yeah. and, and we're very happy to work together to get things accomplished. Um, with our young men and our boys and our males, you guys – Unfortunately, society almost makes it to where you don't have as much luxury to be um, collaborative and to to rely on other people to be able to say, I need help. Yeah. And um, I hope that that's changing because, you know, saying you need help, saying you need um, a ear to, to bend to get to the right decision is not a sign of weakness. Um, in my opinion, it's a sign of strength. So, um, you know, as we get more into an age where like, I'm, I have a lot of young people that work in my office mm -hmm. and the young men are like, they're much more helpmates to their spouses. They're much more engaged in, um, you know, helping rear their children and things like that. I, I hope that, you know, we don't put people in the boxes by gender. That's right. Um, so much so that that it's easier for men to say I need help or I want to work on this together I want to collaborate That's and not have to feel this pressure to be out in front all the time leading you know you have good stuff yeah some uh, preventative measures you think we can take to help our young people you know uh, before they get to the uh, the crime the actual crime you know? so one of the things, and it's not just young people, I have a passion for young people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we have some social ills in our society that make it easier. It you, Sometimes you feel like people are too far gone to help. No one's ever not worthy of redemption. So I don't want anybody to think that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. But um, I have a passion with working with our young people because I feel like we can break cycles. That's right. We can um, change lives if we intervene early and often. So just to give you an example, and it's been kind of something I've been working on for the last year or so, and really, you know, beginning at the end of 2020, no, like mid-2018 saying we have to constant, mid-2019, excuse me, we have to work across silos to to break cycles and social ills that are not criminal justice issues, but that if we don't address them, end up in the criminal justice realm. That's right. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, mental health. It's, it's a huge issue when people are subjected to trauma. The trauma could be a kid living in a home where there's domestic violence. It could be a kid who's lost a parent to gun violence, right? 
there's a lot of trauma associated with that. And yeah. um, if we don't deal with the, that issue as a mental health issue, oftentimes the pent up rage, the pent up um, disappointment, if it's not dealt with properly by counseling, by check-ins, by mentoring, things like that, it comes out and it manifests itself as violence when kids get older. That's so, right. you know, I'm, I'm interested in making sure that I'm working with mental health agencies to make sure kids and adults get the counseling that they need, get the, get the um, treatment that they need to address those issues in a productive way so that they don't manifest themselves in a negative way. Another area is our drug treatment. Um, you know, we know that that's a medical issue. It's, it's, it manifests itself sometimes by illegal drug use to where people get arrested or they get charged or what have you. But yeah. it really is, you know, a, med a, a medical issue. Addiction is a medical issue. And sometimes a mental health issue because sometimes people are, they're using medica uh, they're using illicit drugs or medication to dull the pain, right? And if we don't have robust services for people to get treatment and we let it spiral out of control, oftentimes it becomes criminal issues, right? So yeah. we have to be able to um, work across silos to make sure that there's robust services in our community so people can get the help that they need before it spirals out of control into a criminal issue. And in addition to that, sometimes the issues that come along with mental health and drug addiction, they end up being criminal justice issues because people don't, like we can't, we're not, we're not comfortable saying we can't help you. So let's put you in jail. Yeah. And keep you locked up in a way because we don't have things to control your behavior and deal with the underlying issues, right? Exactly. And what what doesn't make sense about that is that by the time you've got someone incarcerated, by the time you've had police response over and over again to the manifestation of the mental health issue or the drug treatment issue you are spending three times the amount of three, probably more than three times the amount of money that you could have spent in prevention or intervention to help people. Wow. Right. So that's why everybody should care about that issue because you're a taxpayer. I'm a taxpayer. We live here. Yeah. And if we don't deal with it as for what it is and get them the help that they need outpatient, um, sometimes hospitalization, you're going to put them in the detention center and you're going to have to pay to educate them and you're going to have to pay to feed them and house them. That's right. And it, it just doesn't make sense to be doing that over and over again and not trying to help people and to get people the help that they need. So somehow in my mind, you know, I don't know what the solution is totally. It takes the whole community to figure that out, mm -hmm. but I have to challenge myself Number one, to be working with the people at the front end of the system to kind of prevent some of those people to come into our system. And I also have to be working on the back end to win hearts and minds and, you know, convince people that, you know, you say, oh, you say, you, you know, your, your taxes are too high um, and the crime is too bad. But you have to be willing to say, oh, yeah, that drug treatment facility can be in my neighborhood or it can be in my city. Because unless we have those other options to deal with the issues early on, we're going to continue paying the money through our taxes to throw people away. That's and right. No one deserves that. No one deserves that. If we can help them and if we can also, you know, deal with this issue of, most criminals, there are some truly dangerous people, and I would argue there, there are some evil people, okay? Yep. But most people, criminals, are good people who have made bad mistakes in their life. That's right. right. So once we let them pay their debt to society, we have to give them ways to reintegrate into society and the help that they need to change their ways. That's right. 
if we if we tell somebody that they have to pay their debt to society and they do and they come out and they can't find a job and they're not eligible for employment and we stick a scarlet letter around their neck then what do you think is going to happen they're going to recidivate and turn back to crime because we're not giving them a, a way to earn a living wage to support a family to make the connections that you know say to people wow i have a reason to not want to go to jail and be away from my family right okay. um and and so that's another like uh privilege and responsibility that i feel that i have is to be a person that's engaged in our community that's going out that's meeting people that's rubbing shoulders that's telling that story that's right that is you know that's one part of the solution to making the community safer and better in a place that people want to live that's true yeah. so when it comes to the whole uh criminal justice system you know like um is that taken in consideration or is that something that pretty much like a lawyer would have to kind of argue on? What are you talking about? Give me an example. If somebody gets in trouble and then you know they had like a, a bad upbringing, you know. Um, yeah, that's, that's always been taken into consideration. Like I know when I was still doing defense work, I would always say to a judge like, judge, um, I'm not offering this as an excuse for the mm -hmm. behavior like at sentencing, right? I would say, but it's an explanation. If you if you're a child who grew up in a ho household where there's domestic violence, let's say you're the male child who grew up in a household where you saw your father beat their mother yeah. um, over and over again. One group of people would say, well, you know how bad that is. You know how it feels. You shouldn't do it, right? Mm -hmm. Another group of people might have empathy and compassion and say, okay, this is what this child grew up seeing. This is what he thinks, this is what's normalized for him. This is how he thinks a man is supposed to behave and act and interact with women, right? Yeah. And, you know, you, we still can hold a person accountable for their behavior. Let's say that person really hurt a woman, broke, uh, broke their jaw or something like that. We can yeah. still hold them accountable, but we still have to understand that we need to correct the behavior correct the mindset that says that behavior is okay, right? Exactly. So that's that's kind of what we're talking about, about building systems where um, you could say, okay, I'm comfortable with releasing this person from jail because I know there's a really good program that the judge can order that person to go to that's gonna deal with like batterers programs that deal with changing the mindset of men so they don't continue to do the behavior that they do. Or oftentimes we see that that kind of behavior happens because alcohol is involved, right? Wow. Um, or substance abuse is involved. So people that, you know, things that they wouldn't normally do be, if they were sober, they do because they're not sober, right? That's so we have to have strong and robust treatment programs right there in the community, okay? With mental health, it's really, really tricky. Um, oftentimes, Oftentimes, as a prosecutor, you have to be thinking about, okay, how can I make a judge and how can I, okay, let me, let me track, backtrack a little bit. When I was a defense attorney, if I had a client who had mental health issues, right, mm -hmm. I knew that I had to find treatment for them and I had to have some checks and balances so that they could get stable on their med medication to be able to convince a judge to release that that person from jail, right? Wow. So as a prosecutor, now I'm on the other side. If if I was in a courtroom, a practicing prosecutor, I do budgets and most of that stuff, but the prosecutors, they have to have those same tools to feel comfortable to say, okay, um, this person can go to the program, we'll know if they're in compliance or not. Mm -hmm. And that makes me feel comfortable that public safety will be protected if they're released. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so the, that's why we have to have strong and robust programs in our community. Because what happens is, if we don't have them in our community, then people, what, what do you think becomes the biggest treatment provider in the community? The county jail. That's right. That's the truth. 
And that's crazy when you can do it for, you know, $20 a day, but we're doing it for $350 a day because everybody's scared to let that person out because there's no inpatient programs or there's no, um, there's no robust mental health program. Now we have inpatient programs. I'm going to, I don't want people to think that we don't have drug treatment programs, but we certainly can do things to improve and bolster our mental health programs in our community. Awesome stuff. Wow. Great information. Yeah. You know, with all the questions and everything that you answered, how can we holistically fix the community in your opinion to bring everybody together to kind of, like you said, collaborate more for the bigger picture? Well, um, we're talking about it. Um, working across silos, like me not thinking, oh, I'm the county prosecutor. I'm going to sit up here and I'm going to say, you go to jail and you go to jail and you go to jail and not be willing to, to work across disciplines. Like realizing that I need to build relationships with the drug treatment providers, with the mental health organizations in our community, with the schools, mm -hmm. um, with medical providers. Um, realizing that I need to be open to things like, you know, there was 10 years ago we, when we were dealing with drug, with, with people who were addicted to drugs, we would say, oh, they know, you know, they, they have to go cold turkey. Like drugs are illegal. They have to go, go cold turkey. Well, yeah. now we realize that, you know, it is a medical issue, right? So now there's what we call medication assisted treatment. So some people need to be on Suboxone or on something prescribed by a doctor to wean themselves off the physical addiction to drugs, right? And we now know that's okay. And we, see, we have studies that um, show that, that um, you know, there's positive outcomes in recovery if we do it this way. So we have to be open to those ideas, right? Yeah. To, you know, be willing to listen and to trust but verify, right? To be able to 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 build relationships with people that you can call on and then be open to saying, okay, let's try this. Let's see if this works. Let's um then go back six months later and see did we have better outcomes, right? Yeah. Holistic part of it. And that's hard work. It's not done. It's it's not something that you can choose to say, I'm going to do for a day. It has to become part of the way that you uh, operate and do business. Wow. And, uh, I actually love that because I love interacting with people and I love learning new things. But sometimes it's threatening when you give up a little power, right? And you give up a little bit of the decision making to other people. But I think it's important to do that because I feel like we all that norm in most circumstances we do better when we work together and we all row in the same direction. That's right. Yeah. That's the truth. Yeah. So appreciate all the information, you know, thank you for yeah. coming, catching up with coach and taking the time out of your busy schedule. And I, th I just want to say before we leave, I thank you for everything that you do. We don't talk all the time, but um, I watch what you're doing for the community. I, I watch, um, I watched you during a time when our community was in crisis and how you be, you, you were a constant, um, calm voice of reason. And, um, I just want to say thank you for being like a gem of our community and being an example and a role model and a mentor to, um, young men, because, um, I believe, and this is a Frederick Doug Douglass quote, it's easier to build strong men than to have to repair them. That it's, it's, that's not the exact quote. Mm -hmm. It's easier to build strong young men than have to go back and fix them. That's right. And, and that's women too. That's everybody. Um, and you're doing that. You're, you're building strong, you know, children who become, who I know are going to become strong community members just by the example that you're setting. And I just, I appreciate you so much. All right. Likewise, sis. Thanks for the encouragement. Yes. Yes. And please so, call on me anytime. And likewise, if there's anything that I can continue to do, just let me know. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So thanks for coming on again, for catching up with Coach. 
That was our county prosecutor, Jennifer Webb McCray. Make sure you have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Take care.